I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the book of uh, Ephesians, chapter 5. I'm going to read in a moment from verses 22 and onwards. We're speaking about marriage and family, speaking about Christ-centered marriage, how the Holy Spirit brings us together as husband and wife, and how he reveals God's love through us, very specially in marriage. And it's the second message in a whole series on spirit-filled relationships. I began it last week in the afternoon services, so the 11 o'clock service, you can pick it up online. It's online now, so you can make, get the whole series. I'll give you a little bit of a recap so that you can flow with the second message today. The passage that I'm speaking from is about being filled with the Holy Spirit. It talks about don't be drunk, but be filled with the Spirit, meaning that God wants to take full control of your life so you would not be addicted to alcohol or what have you, but you would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And whether you uh, come from a life-controlling background, whether it's drugs, alcohol, or anything else, or whether you're just a normal sinner, you still need the Holy Spirit to help you in your life. And the way the Holy Spirit helps manifest Jesus in us and through us is supremely through relationships. The first message last week was talking about relationships in the body of Christ and how as we demonstrate the love of Jesus to one another and the world looks on and says see how they love one another then the credibility factor rises and people are attracted to the community of God's people. Now today we're going to go further and the next passage deals with relationship, spirit-filled relationship in marriage and next week we're going to look at children, then we're going to look at relationships at work, and then how we influence society through the relationships are, which are controlled by the Holy Spirit. So let's read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 and onwards. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, and as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband." I want to imagine today being a Saturday, a wedding day Saturday. Philomena has decked out the church to make every Saturday look like the best Valentine's Day you ever had. Beautiful decorations, the aisle parted in the middle, and at the front there is a young man dashing, dressed in a way that is surprising to all looking as clean as a pin, and there his wife's his wife to be, so beautiful, the bride at the front. And there is the pastor standing about to conduct the ceremony. I wonder what she's thinking. I wonder what's going on inside her. And the same for him. Now, if any of my Freudian slips, the slips of tongue that I've had over the years in marriages, not often, but the two incidents I'm about to share are highly embarrassing. And so I'm the one who's embarrassed today. You may laugh freely. It's okay. I'm over it. 
But you know, at the point when it comes to make a, the declaration and uh, ask, are you willing to take this man as your lawful wedded husband? You know that, that part? The words came out, do you take this man to be your awful wedded husband? <laughs> Everybody looked a bit shocked. Now, it was not the same occasion, but another occasion, and I just wonder if that's what she was thinking, and I kind of picked it up somehow. Another occasion, as I, as I come to make this statement, those whom God has joined together, let no man put asunder. All right? Those whom God has lawfully joined together, let no man put asunder. Very, very simple, but these are the words that came out. Now, those whom God has joyfully loined together... Let no man put us asunder. Will you think about that? Uh, the, the purer of minds will take a little while to get that one. And I wonder if that was, on, was what the bridegroom was thinking. There's one thing on his mind. Well, actually, if you had an x-ray machine to go deep down into the heart of what people are thinking, deep, deep down, maybe not even consciously thinking, usually it would be something like this. The bride would be thinking deep down in, inside her you know, it's so wonderful. I'm so happy to get it, be getting married to you today. You've been so wonderful. You make me feel so good. And I'm, I've got the rest of my life it's all set up now. I'm going to feel like this forever because you're about to make sure that I'm going to be happy forever. And, 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 and it's all going to be just like it is today. And then the husband or the bridegroom is thinking, oh, I'm so happy as I'm looking at you. You're so beautiful and you've just made me feel so good. You've made me feel so happy. And your job is to make me feel like this every day of my life forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> now, the people who are laughing are the married people. The people who are not laughing are the single people saying, tell me, is there something I should know here? <laughs> and, and the truth is, is that we do go into relationships often from the wrong perspective, from a selfish perspective, thinking that it's about the other person taking care of us at whatever cost to themselves. But that's not what love is. Love is taking care of somebody else at whatever cost to yourself. A marriage, being the closest of all blessed relationships on this planet, as God ordained it and God gave it, it's such a close, intimate relationship that it's the only relationship where there is permitted by God and blessed by God to be a physical union. Not that other relationships are unimportant and we're to express God's love in all our relationships. But the marriage relationship is the closest relationship ever permitted and blessed by God between a man and a woman. And it is, as we've read, such a remarkable representation, an earthly picture of a reality which is deeply spiritual. Marriages are given by God as a demonstration of the love of God to us. In other words, it's a picture of the love relationship between Jesus and his church, the body of Christ, the bride. And so what happens is that Jesus so loves us at any cost to himself that if it took even death on the cross, he gladly paid that price, and that's how we know what love is. And the church, for her part, is also responding out of this love. We love because he first loved us. So we understand that love is not a feeling first thing. When Jesus died on the cross, there was not one good feeling in his body. It was physically impossible for in any way whatsoever for one good feeling, whether it is a physical feeling or an emotional feeling, because the agony of the cross, but he loved. And there on the cross, he chose to love us, though he didn't feel good. Not only is love not a feeling first thing, it's about what you do for others, not what they do for you. Love is not about me protecting myself from personal pain in order for you to take care of my well-being. It's the exact opposite. Love is about me being prepared to take whatever it, pay whatever it costs, do whatever it takes, whatever cost to myself, whatever pain to myself, to make sure that you are blessed and that your life is enriched. And in this closest and most intimate of all relationships, the greatest opportunity we ever have to put God's love on total display. And you cannot show 
the love of God in this way other than knowing God's love in your own heart. Now, you know, we're going to look at some Bible basics, and I don't want to treat you today as children over some of these Bible basics, but allow me to fill you in and to go over these point by point because they need to be established and re-established, not just in the church, but in society, because our society has gone so far away from the principles of God's word. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, the full verses 26, 27, and 28 give us some primers on relationship. First of all, the Bible says, verse 26, God made us in his image. We are image bearers. Equally male and female, image bearers. What does it mean to bear God's image? We could look at some of the psychological capacities that we have as personalities of human beings. We could talk about our rational capacity to think and reason, talk about our emotional capacity to feel. We could talk about our volitional capacity to make choices. And I agree with those analysis, with that analysis. However, it doesn't really get to the real point. When God says he created us in his image, what he's talking about is he's given us a capacity, he's gifted us with a calling and a capacity to reflect his glory into the world. And especially his relational glory. And that very quickly we see that from the next verse because it goes on to say not only are we image bearers but verse 27 of Genesis 1 speaks about us being gendered image bearers. Male and female he created them. And it's so simple. The Bible declares it and because the Bible declares it even though biology confirms it people are prepared to ignore biology and do their own thing here because they want to reject God's word. It's the enemy of our souls that's behind this. I'm speaking about the transgender issue today. In fact a whole range of gender confusions are in our society today. Male and female is an identity rooted in the fundamental differences between men and women. We can speak about it biologically, we can speak about it de- uh, genetically, anatomically, physiologically, chemi- <laughs> chemically, chemical distinction. And above all, for us as believers, we see there is a spiritual distinction. There's a special way that you bring glory to God as a feminine woman. And a special way that we bring glory to God as a masculine man. But those words, masculine and feminine, must not be uh, interpreted purely through social and cultural trends. There is a way of being a godly man, a way of being a godly woman that is way beyond any earthly cultural interpretation of that. So at times, it is right to rebel against social culture and social convention in order to honor God and be the man of God and the woman of God that God calls us to be. That's all that's for another time. But the main point is this. God has made us either male or female. Uh, Not neither male nor female. Not both male and female or take your pick and choose. No, This is part of God's creation order. And the transgender issue is more about persona than it is about real identity. I wish our society would grasp this. It's more about how a person wants to present themselves for various reasons. It's not about their real identity. I'll tell you a story just to back this up. Many years ago, as a man here who had a full uh, gender reassignment and uh, wonderful spirit-filled person and uh, the the closer they got to Jesus the more they said I I, want to go back to my real identity and this is what he said he said you know before I was a Christian I, I felt like I was a woman trapped in a man's body And now that person got saved and found out who they really were the tragedy was now they said I feel like a Man trapped in a woman's body. 
Can you see the tragedy? They had a false understanding of their sexual identity. And we must establish in our children, in our community, and be a good witness for the wider community of what it means to be a male, what it means to be a female. As I say, it's not, it's not about stereotypes either. So, gendered image bearers. But there is a purpose behind this. Verse 28 has three phrases. It says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. I want you to learn from this that this, is, this language is kingdom vocabulary. You see it. Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. That's the language of kingdom. So here's a strong statement that brings it all together. Through gendered image bearers, God puts himself on display. And in so doing, he reflects his relational glory. Because God's a relational God. It's all about relationship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's this relational party, relational celebration in heaven, and we are brought into it. So God, through us, puts his relational glory on display, and he does so in such a way that as this multiplying humanity increases, more and more people come to know him and love him and are part of the kingdom of God. So this tells us that God has a plan for family, and marriage is right there at the heart of it. Now in Paul speaking here, he quotes Genesis 2.24. Genesis 2.24 and 25 read like this. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked. That's of course the original um, married couple. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. What a beautiful picture of marriage. And that verse is repeated four more times in the Bible. It's the Bible basic foundation on marriage. Let's look at it briefly. I'm still nailing some basic principles here. Bear with me. Biblical covenant of marriage. That's what it is. It's a covenant of marriage. And uh, first of all, it is a covenant of marriage that involves a man and a woman. Now, I would not have thought even five years ago that I'd have to spend time on that one. But the gay marriage that is accepted by our society, and by the way, we as Christians have to acknowledge that that exists out there in the, in, the, in the secular world. We don't have to agree with it, but to say that it doesn't exist and ignore it is quite wrong. But we still must stand for the biblical revelation because gay marriage is neither holy matrimony that has been practiced by the church for generations, neither is it the biblical covenant of marriage. The Bible says it, a man and, and, and a woman. And how we reestablish that and reach out to people who are gay and have same-sex attraction with the love of Christ is a whole other topic, and we'll come back to that at some stage. But it is between a man and a woman, and a man, a woman, not one man, several women, several women, one man, two or three men and women mixed up together. And we, we laugh, but it's coming. It's coming. Don't think that that's not coming. So, a man and a woman, and it involves, uh, from the perspective of the man here, leaving mother and father and cleaving to his wife. Leaving and cleaving, leaving. What does that mean? It means that you leave that social structure and set up a new social structure, a new social unit, a new decision-making unit. And that's very, very important. Even for those who have left home many years before they marry, so they have to go through this process and understand what it means. We cover that in our premarital counseling in the church. Now, the joining together, the cleaving, is very important because, first of all, it's exclusive, and secondly, it's lifelong. It's exclusive. You cleave to one. Okay? So it's marital faithfulness. And also, it's permanent. Well, for life, anyway. So you choose her, cleave to her, you stick to her, guys. That's it. Okay. Now, a number of years ago, many years ago, I read about it, there's a man called Henry Ford. How many people know of Henry Ford? He was man who started the Ford company and all that kind of stuff. And he was made famous and rich by one model, which was the Model T. The Model T, the Ford Model T. They called it the Tin Lizzie. 
and uh, Henry Ford was celebrating his 50th anniversary. And they asked him, you know, in a kind of joviality, tell us, Henry, what is, well, they would have said it in a different accent, okay? Tell us, Henry, what is it that makes your marriage and your life so long and so happy and so successful? Well, he stood up, did Henry Ford, and he said, it's just the same as in the automobile business. Stick to one model. Mm. <laughs> and as we shall see, unlike the automobile business, you don't get to test drive that model. But that's another story. So it is man and woman leaving, cleaving, and becoming one flesh. The becoming one flesh immediately causes us to think about the physical sexual union, and I'm sure it includes that as the holy of holies of all human relationships within marriage. And the coming together in a sexual union is a seal of the covenant that has been made. Now remember, you've got to get it right. If you're writing a letter, which you probably don't do these days, you put the letter into the envelope and then you seal it. You've got to get the order right. You don't seal it and then find, oh, what, what about the letter? In every aspect of sealing, order is important. Let me just go over this again, just in case we missed it, boys and girls. First, you get married, then you enjoy a sexual relationship. All right? Amen, amen, amen. amen. All right. We say that, but that needs to be reestablished because almost universally it is ignored, not just by the world, but increasingly by people in the church. And we need to understand that. Again, some of this, the sexuality of this, I'm going to have to come back and do another series because we don't have time to do everything. But I'm just laying out some of the basic ground and the basic territory. So coming together is not just about physical sexual union, it is becoming one flesh, one person. And it's about developing deep relational unity to demonstrate the relational unity that there is between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons, in unity, and we are demonstrating that in a unique way, just as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit you have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of love. In marriage, you have a father, or you have at least a husband, a wife, and the Spirit of love. And this means openness, mutual honor, mutual respect, being naked and not ashamed. And that's not just about being physically able to be physically naked and not ashamed, but to be open in this open, close, beautiful, intimate relationship. I mean, it's glorious. Just like the relationship between Jesus and his church. And then there's this unique complementarity about it. Marriage isn't two becoming one flesh. That's him taking her over so she's squashed and she has no more personality. Or the other way around, the wife taking him over. So the question is, uh, what did you say, darling? Um, I, I remember um, I was teaching on this in one of the churches I was leading a number of years ago and there was a a couple there, one of the elders and his wife, and, and he was a very loving man. He was very nice. But as a Christian man, can I just say, uh, he was just a bit too nice, okay? I mean, he's in heaven now, so he knows better. But uh, he was so nice. And, and I was talking about conflict, resolving conflict, and doing all my, you know, pompous statements about communication, reconciliation, forgiveness, and all this kind of stuff. And she, he piped up and... Um, no, she piped up and she said, um, well, it doesn't apply to us. I said, why? Don't you resolve conflict? No, we've never had a conflict in all our married life. Have we, darling? <laughs> and he went, oh, oh, no, that's right, dear. <laughs> so it's not about taking one another over, okay? Your wife has a personality. Your job as a husband is to bring that personality to all the fullness of ex expression, the full potential. That's your job, just as Jesus brings the best out in you, bring the best out in one another. Hallelujah. That's the plan, but we know the devil has messed with the plan. Now, I'm not going to go straight to talking about how marriage has been destroyed in our society go on the website of the Marriage Foundation, and you find that it is not as bad as society wants to make us think. They want to make us think that marriage is done and dusted and over. It is not. Do you know, 81% of people who live in families with, ma with uh, two parents, they're married. 
Do you know what the average length of a marriage is in Britain? Let's get some answers from the, uh, from the floor. And hold back if you know the real answer, but just let's get all the wrong answers first, so nobody's going to speak. How long do you think the average marriage lasts in Britain? Hmm? Ten years. Well, that's more than what most people say. Any advance on ten? The truth is, it is 32 years. The average marriage lasts 32 years. And 93% of families where there are teenage children, 17 around, they are married families. That's amazing. And the single greatest cause of family breakdown in Britain, what is that? Marriage is collapsing? Divorce? No. The single greatest breakdown of family relationships in Britain is unmarried parents with small children. There's a whole story there as to why living together, cohabiting, demonstrates that it's not any substitute for marriage. It's not even a good way of doing things to sustain long-term relationships. Well, there's a whole lot more statistics. I've got six pages here, but uh, God help me not to go more because I'll bore you with statistics. But nevertheless, the devil has messed with it. Now, I want to quote a writer from the Daily Telegraph, Fraser Nelson. It was about a year ago he wrote this, but it summarizes the reality in Britain. He says, we have the highest rates of family breakdown in Western Europe. With one in five children living with a lone parent, about half of all births take place out of marriage. That's, 50, that's 47%. And by the age of 15, listen to this, by the age of 15, a child is more likely to have a smartphone in their pocket than a father in the house. So it's not about pointing the finger and condemning. It's about looking and seeing how we can repair this stuff and be good citizens and to restore marriages and to place marriage and family high on our agenda as a spirit-filled relationship demonstrating the love of God in a way no other relationship can. The devil messed with it through the fall. Adam and Eve sinned, and as a result of that, they were naked and ashamed, and that means their relationship was broken. Never was it to be the same again. And God began to repair it. And uh, in Christ, it is being restored. And thank God that the battle of the sexes can end. We can put our weapons down as we learn to love one another as husband and wife in the way that God has called us to do so to demonstrate the love of Jesus. And if, even if you're not yet married, you can work on this. If you are single today and you believe that God is calling you to be married at some stage in your life, the best way of preparing is to be so full, so satisfied of Jesus, then you become ten times more attractive to any men in the church. I'll tell you that's for sure. That's for sure. There's a whole lot to be working on. And so thank God that God is bringing uh, restoration and redemption to marriage and And what does it look like then, a spirit-filled marriage? What does it look like? Well, these verses tell us. Husbands are the custodians of love. Now, that's countercultural, because we think it's the women's job. We men come home rough and rough, and the women rush around, make everything nice. We are responsible for the love in the home. Don't say amen, men. Just be quiet. (laughs) If you want to say something, say ouch. Okay? It's not up to her. The love. You give the love. Amen. We love him, Jesus, because he first loved us. Men, try it. It works. Spirit-filled men will always do that. Love as leader. Loving leader. That's what it is. A loving leader. A loving leader. We take the initiative. Love always takes the initiative. In fact, it's love as Christ loved the church, the the Bible says, meaning love your wife enough that you would be prepared to die for her. (laughs) At least in the nine o'clock, the women said amen. (laughs) It's self-sacrificial love. Woman, the women, they are the helper. 
So role is not inferior because the Holy Spirit's called the helper and he's equal to God. So there's a helping role. And there's a role of submission. Jesus is in submission to his father, but he's not in subordination to his father. He's not subordinate to his father. You get that? So it's not about equality here. It's about a role. She, her role is to love her husband so much that she is willing to live for him. It's just a kind of take on the, the, this uh, expression. Now, before we start talking about the role of husband and wife, and I dislike it because I've heard so much on it, and it leaves me cold because nobody establishes the identity. They start talking about the functional role, and that becomes terrible. So we have the role of husband in the, in the, in the church or the, in, in the family, the role of the wife, the role of women in the church, the role of women in society. <sighs> what? Before you talk about your role, that's what you are called to do, you need to discover who you are. Because your activity, your role, comes from your identity, who you are. And we'll come back to this when we talk about gender and sexuality. But there is a difference between the way a man is called to demonstrate the relational nature of God from the way a woman is called to demonstrate the relational nature of God. Both are gifted to demonstrate different aspects. The male, to be a godly masculine man, is a person who is gifted in initiating godly movement. Remember I said, remember the kingdom? The male is gifted to initiate kingdom movement. And the woman, she is gifted to respond and nurture kingdom movement, but even before that, she is gifted to inspire it. Think about this. Women, can I speak to you? You have a gift, a God-given gift of bringing out the best in us men. Did you know that? That's your gift. And, and you have such a way of doing it. Your beauty is so invitational, it invites godly movement. That's why so many men can say, thank God for my praying mother, my great paying, pray, praying grandmother, and my paying grandmother as well. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's remarkable. Women, you know, Amanda, I just want to say, I'm getting all mushy, I suppose, on Valentine's Day, but you know, you are so gifted at bringing the best out in me. When I'm with you, I want to be the best I can be. <laughs> and so when we look at these, we discover then that the relationship is not of domineering, do what I say, lady, or capitulating, yes, dear, Wives, they're not doormats, wipe your feet over me, I'm supposed to just do whatever you say. No, no, no. Ladies, submitting to your husband and everything is nothing about doing everything he tells you to do. It means bring the best out of him and respond to the Jesus in him and the kingdom that God is bringing into your marriage through him. Amen. That's what it means. Amen. So let me bring this to conclusion and just be a little bit more precise on some of these things and then... I'm sorry, I'm going to say this throughout the whole series. We'll come back to this, we'll come back to this, we'll come back to this. It doesn't matter. Let's deal with what we can deal with at any one moment. So here, here's the statement. This is the take-home statement I want you to take home with you. Marriage is all about putting the love of Christ on display in a very special way. Now, every relationship we expect to put God on display. All right? So I'm not, I'm not denying that. But, but the, the truth is, is that the marriage relationship, because it's the closest of all blessed human relationships, it's absolutely necessary that we learn how to give God the honor and glory in the way we relate. So marriage is an opportunity. Now, you know, say this, this is so relevant. Marriage is a test because it's supposed to be a testimony. 
You can't have a testimony without a test. Men, you are going to be tested to your limit and beyond. C'est la vie, ça c'est la mariage, et aussi ça c'est l'amour. Had to say it in French because you couldn't take it in English. <laughs> it's going to take you to the very limit of what you can do because your job is to do whatever it takes to bless your wife, even if it costs you everything. Put the love of Christ on display in such a way as to reflect God's relational glory, especially the relationship between Christ and his church. Kingdom. So husbands, how do you do that? How do you put Christ on display in the way you relate to your, to your wife? Let's go over the passage. Love sacrifices whatever it takes. Christ loved the church, he gave himself for the church. He loves her so fully, so completely, holds her nothing back, did whatever it cost, cost him everything. When we start loving like that in our relationships, and our marriages, I tell you, they'll come knocking on the door. Show us how you do that. Love nourishes and cherishes. He's saying, you know, <laughs> this is a true saying. If you love your wife, you're loving yourself. Okay. <laughs> All right. Only married men will know what that means. In other words, it's you in your best interest to make sure that lady is happy. Because if she ain't, you're not going to be. That's to spell it out. All right, that's to spell it out. Because I'm in such an innocent congregation today. But he says, you know, no one despises his own flesh. If your wife is your own flesh, then when you're loving her, you are in a way loving yourself. That's not the point, though, but it's just saying, you, just in the way that you treat your, your own body, that's how you treat your wife. You nourish, you cherish, you develop, you build, you bring to fullness. Jesus is bringing the church to fullness. He's coming back for a glorious church of fullness without adolescent spots or old age wrinkles. He's coming back for a church which is prepared to perfection, prepared for this lovely, amazing church. Wedding day. And so we love our wives to that extent. We bring them to fullness. And we do so whatever response. Don't think I love her, she loves me. No. One of the painful things about marriage and rela all relationships is that the risk is you will not be loved back. If you've ever been in a loveless marriage, you'll know what I'm talking about. And it's possible. That you as a man can love and love and get nothing back. I've spoken to men just weeping. Say, she won't give me anything back. And also the other way around. You, you, you as a woman could be doing everything God called you to do. Showing your relational beauty. Invitational beauty. Nurturing beauty. But nothing of the kingdom of God is coming in your direction from him. That's why Peter says, if that happens, love your husbands without talk. Zip it up. But by your behavior. Wives, how do you put Christ on display in the way you relate to your husband? Words are submission, obedience, subjection. Quite ugly words in their connotations today. They need to be rehabilitated and put back in biblical context. What this really means is in the same way that you submit to Christ who brings God's kingdom, so you submit to every godly movement that represents that kingdom in your husband's life. And if it's not there, try and bring it out. Amen and amen. Embrace and nurture every movement of the kingdom in everything. Be in this place of submission. It's not subordination. Jesus is in submission to the Father, but he's equal to the Father. The Holy Spirit's the helper. And if there is a help meet, a helper suitable, it's not a negative word. The Holy Spirit's the helper. He's equal to the Father. He's equal to the Son. It's about how we share in our roles together because we recognize who we are. So the question now remains, what about those who are not married? Well, 
There are two kinds of people who are not married. One, they're not married and they don't want to be because God has called them to a life of singleness. I want them honored in the church. Just because a woman is 45 or 50 or 60 or 70, not married, never been married, don't think she's been left on the shelf. Sometimes and often she's been chosen by Jesus to display something exceptional. Amen. But there are also both men and women, but because our women outnumber our men, it's often the women who are longing to be married and don't want to compromise and are struggling with this. If that's you today, let me tell you again. God's love in your life will not only prepare you for marriage, but will prepare you for whatever lies ahead. And in the discussions that I've asked to go, I've got the notes here for the cell leaders, there are seven questions to ask, and you will never do all that in one cell meeting. You might want to come back to it more than once. Uh, but you, you choose the best questions for you today and, and this week. But some of those questions have to do with what can we do to help single people find their partner? Can I have a strong amen? amen. All right. I, and what we can do to help people whose marriages are struggling, we have a marriage enrichment course, but also people for whom it's too late, it's all gone, broken, and, and you're divorced. Uh, you're not second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. And how do we work together as a church to promote all these relationships, and how do we represent this to the world in a way that is not bigoted, not homophobic, and we don't beat down transgendered people, we don't beat down gay people, we don't speak negatively against all their, their chosen lifestyles, but we show them something better that is rooted and grounded in more than biology, but in theology and in a relationship with Jesus Christ. For true spirit-filled living is laying our all before him. Amen and amen. There's no sin.